Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 2.3. This is part 2 of proteins um, and we'll be looking at globular and fibrous proteins. Now last video we really talked about how um, there are different levels of structure of proteins but also um, in general there are two types of proteins okay, regardless of level of structure which is globular and fibrous proteins. Now this is how they differ. Now, globular proteins are spherical or ball-shaped, so they're kind of like ball. And fibrous proteins are usually long parallel strand. Now, globular proteins are mostly tertiary, sometimes quaternary. Um, they're mostly 3D shaped. Now, fibrous proteins, however, are mostly secondary and form fibers, but sometimes it can be quaternary or tertiary right it's mostly secondary but not always now globular proteins are soluble and have more functional roles so all enzymes are globular proteins antibodies are globular proteins some hormones are globular proteins myoglobin and hemoglobin are all globular proteins and this is because they are soluble so they are easily transported in the blood so it makes sense that the all these functional kind of proteins are globular proteins. However, we look at fibrous proteins, uh, because of its insoluble nature, it makes sense that it takes on more structural roles. And this is because it's insoluble, right? It's, it's steady, it's rigid, okay? It may have high tensile strength, and therefore it's very suitable to be, you know, a structural role, right? It's not soluble in water. Now, an example for this is collagen and keratin. Now, keratin, you can see here, this is a secondary structure, but collagen that we're going to learn will have a quaternary structure, and we'll look at it later. Let's start with an example of a globular protein, um, which is hemoglobin. Now, our first question would be, what makes globular protein soluble? This is all across the board, okay? It applies to hemoglobin and everything else as well. What makes globular protein soluble? It's because of this. It's sequence and structure. Amino acids with non-polar or hydrophobic R groups point inward, whereas amino acids with polar or hydrophobic R group faces the outside. Does that make sense? So if this is the primary structure, this would be a tertiary structure. Let's say these balls here are hydrophobic. These are going to clump inside, okay, and you can say it will form hydrophobic interactions, but they're going to point inside away from water, whereas these hydrophilic R groups are going to face the outside and interact with water. Now, overall, this molecule will be soluble because the outside interacts with the water. And yeah. So, yeah, remember this. This is incredibly important, incredibly, incredibly important, and it will come up very often, and you see it in many different contexts, not only proteins. Very important concept. Okay, but this is why it's soluble, and this is why hemoglobin is soluble as well, because, again, hydrophobic R groups point inward, whereas hydrophilic R group point outside. Now, hemoglobin, let's look at more, even more of its structure. I know most of you have already done this, but here's a recap. Now, it is, it has four polypeptide chains and therefore it's a quaternary structure. And these four polypeptide chains are actually two alpha globin and two beta globin chains. By the way, it's not goblin, whatever Korean drama you're watching. No, it's globin, as in globular. Now, the two alpha chains and two beta chains come together to form this. And yeah, as we said, hydrophobic R groups of each of these chains point inside and hydrophilic R groups face outside, making the hemoglobin soluble. Now, each polypeptide has a hem group. In the hem group you can see here. The hem group is a non-amino acid group, or we also call it a prosthetic group. The hem group is a type of prosthetic group. And what it has, you don't need to memorize the structure here, but what it has is it has an iron in the center. It is a permanent part of hemoglobin, by the way. Right, the iron here is Fe2 plus, and this can bind one oxygen molecule. So in 
because they have four different M group, this means that one hemoglobin can bind four molecules of oxygen. Now, a trick question here. If they ask you how many atoms of oxygen can a hemoglobin bind, you have to say eight. Four molecules of oxygen, but eight atoms of oxygen. They can be like tricky like that, so be careful, okay? So yeah, that's hemoglobin, just some familiar material to you, right? Very easy, definitely globular. Functional role, transports oxygen. By the way, hemoglobin is not to be mixed up with red blood cell. This is a red blood cell. There is many, many hemoglobin inside it. Red blood cell is a cell. Hemoglobin is a protein. So you must make sure you know the difference. Red blood cell, cell. Hemoglobin, plenty in one red blood cell, okay? Okay. Now that's globular protein. Let's move on to the fibrous protein example, collagen. Now collagen is very interesting. Look at it, it's so cool. It forms fibers, it has high tensile strength. So how is it, how, how, how is the structure like? So this is it in detail. Now every third amino acid of this polypeptide is glycine. This is the collagen polypeptide. We don't call it the molecule yet. I'll tell you why in a moment. Now the collagen polypeptide, every third one is glycine. So this is glycine, 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 and what? No, so on so forth, right? So every third one is glycine. Why? Because it is the smallest R group and it's useful later. Now usually it's proline alanine glycine, but this two can change. But glycine will not change. Glycine will always be there. The third one must be glycine. Why? Smallest R group. So they can tightly wound. So you can see here, the collagen molecule is made out of three polypeptide chains. And it forms what we call a triple helix. Not alpha helix, that is different. We saw just now itself. We saw last video. What is an alpha helix? That is definitely not this. Three polypeptide chains form a triple helical collagen molecule. And it can wound tightly, can coil tightly around each other like a braid because glycine is there. And between these polypeptide chains are hydrogen ions. Now at this stage, because it involves three different polypeptides, you can say that the collagen molecule is definitely a quaternary structure. Okay, now how about the fiber? Okay, how does it form the fiber? So polypeptide, three of them, three times, will form the collagen molecule. What do the co collagen molecules do? They lie parallel to each other, okay, straight lines, and form covalent crosslinks. And these covalent crosslinks form between lysines, actually, okay, which are found in many of those collagen as well. And uh, as you can see, it's not just lying parallel, they have staggered ends, so like a like a brick formation kind of here. It's staggered so that there's no weak spot. So it's equally strong throughout. Many, many, many of these form fibrils and many fibrils form fibers. Okay, so what's going on again? Three polypeptide chains form collagen molecule. And the collagen molecule is held together by hydrogen bonds. So there are hydrogen bonds between this polypeptide chain. Many of these molecules form a fibril, right? And these, these different molecules are, are held together by covalent cross linkages or covalent cross links. So do not mix these two up. Different polypeptides are held together by hydrogen bonds to form a molecule. A molecule form covalent crosslinks with other molecules to form a fibril. Very, very important to not mix that up. 
But yeah, all these things, all these things makes collagen a molecule with high tensile strength and it's very suitable to be a structural protein. It is definitely not soluble and yeah, it's really strong. And that's it for collagen. The last thing of each biomolecule we got to learn is of course the identification test. And you guys should be familiar with this already, but here's like a little reminder. To the identification test for proteins is using the Burette test. And Burette is actually, Burette reagent is really copper 2 sulfate and dilute potassium hydroxide. Now, um, you can add 2 cm cube of Burette solution to 2 cm cube sample, so equal amounts. And if protein is present, it will give you a purple result. If not, it will be blue. Now, why does it change color like this? It's important to remember that copper ions, copper 2 plus, this is blue. However, uh, when the amine groups of amino acids react with copper ions, this forms a complex which is purple in color, so giving you the positive result for proteins. So yeah, that's it for proteins. The next video is going to be about water. Stay tuned, guys. Bye.